Hey, how's it going? My name is Mike Squires, and this is Couchless Podcast, episode number 190. And my guest, Mark Watrous. Um, Mark uh, came on my radar about probably 2000, I'm guessing. Might have been earlier, actually. I don't, I don't, well, maybe I should listen to the conversation that we had. But uh, he was in a band from the Tri Cities called Louder Milk, who was playing some shows coming up and uh they were just like the most incredible band i'd ever seen in a club it was un pretty unreal it was awesome and uh i they made a record we talk about the arc of that band a lot in this conversation and uh it's a record that stands up i still listen to it a lot you know 20 years on i listen to it at least once a month Let's check it out louder milk the red record, not the red album, the red record. Um, Mark has gone on to do a lot of things. Uh, probably the thing that he's most well known for is being in the shins now. Um, but he he toured with the Rack and Tours, did a tour with the Rack and Tours. Yeah, done a lot of very cool stuff. He's living in Nashville, and uh, we played a gig recently together. You see my laminate back there. It was a friend's birthday party down in Nashville. And it was a, it was a pleasure to get to actually perform with him and, and some other friends. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Mark is a lovely fella. Um, let's see. That's, uh, that's, that's what I want to... Oh, I want to give you the dates. They're going to... Uh, they, being Louder Milk, they're playing September 30th in Seattle. This is 20 fucking 21 that's what year it is in case you're wondering right now um 2021 september 30 in seattle october 1 in spokane washington and october 2 in richland washington where they're from the tri-cities they're all from the tri-cities so go check them out i might i might try to go out there and see them because i love the band that much and this will probably be the last opportunity i have to see them so um that would be I, yeah i'd be bummed to miss it but i might have to that's it thank you so much for uh watching listening thank you so much for supporting couch Riffs on patreon appreciate it that's what makes this possible uh thank you for commenting liking sharing all the things it's how it's what propels this whole thing so i really appreciate it also thank you to variety coffee roasters now variety coffee roasters i drink every single day i love it um they support couch riffs and and uh so that's uh, we're uh, we're married now so here's what i want to let you know if you want one of these you know that's pretty fancy, right? Co-branded coffee mug. If you want one of those, just go to uh, varietycoffeeroasters.com. Get two of these. They're, uh, they're bags of coffee come in these nice little boxes that look like cigarette cases, um, cartons. Uh, you buy two boxes of coffee, add a mug to your cart, and at checkout, use the code COUCHRIFFS, all one word, lowercase letters, COUCHRIFFS. And you get your mug for free. That's pretty fancy. Also, while you're over there, check out their subscription service. It's awesome. Uh, you'll go through a series of questions and they'll help you find the perfect coffee on their menu for you. So thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters. You guys are, you guys are great. You guys are great. I, I like you guys. Also, thank you to River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington. River City Guitars is a small but mighty uh, vintage boutique and you know generally cool uh, guitar music shop every day is a buying day if you've got something that you would like to sell or trade or uh, sort out give them a shout sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com tell them i sent you that's also one of the only places where you can get one of these beautiful amazing simple rock machines that i co-designed with marvin guitars keith over at marvin guitars helped 
uh, bring that little dream to life for uh, Cowtriffs and for me. So uh, go check that out over there. We're going to get into the episode now. Um, I hope you enjoy this as much as I did because I very much enjoyed it. Don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. The world would be perfect if you just weren't an asshole. We're in business. You're in business. We're in business, my friend. Cool. How you doing? I'm good. I just saw you two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, was it? Back? At, oh, uh, it was fine. It was fine. I nice. didn't go through the city. You know, I went through Albany. Oh, okay. So for people who, like, we're started. I start recording from the top, and this is a pretty loose operation, Mark. <laughs> Uh, for people who are listening, we played a gig together. My first gig since the shit hit the fan in uh, February 2020. That was my last gig. Yeah. And um, what a it gig was, it was. I did, I think I did like an online thing with a friend last November. And that was it. That was, you know, it's I haven't done anything in front of an audience uh, either since, yeah, probably February of 2020. Oh, that was a shared experience. Yeah. Wow. And it was good. We're we're bonded now. Like, <laughs> forever. Yeah. Well, you can never take that away. Uh this is your remodeled studio. Yeah. Looks Yeah. Great. It's it's kind of a mess right now. It's it's I'm not totally done. Let's ah. let's start by talking about that. Okay. So that we uh so you know, so that uh if there's anyone listening that wants to come work with you or send yeah. you some stuff to work on they know straight out of the gate uh what you're up to so you live in nashville yeah how long have you been there i've been 11 years i think that's a pretty good amount of time yeah we didn't think we would stay here that long and then we had a kid and i wasn't ready to i wasn't ready to go anywhere else and then all of a sudden i was and then my wife was like no we've got a kid now and we our friends have kids here and we're we're locked in now right and my my mom and my brother both moved here, so it's kind of they did. Yeah, yeah, it's oh, we're wow. all this is home base for everyone now. Oh, that's great. Which is nice. Were they in the Tri Cities before? Yeah, yeah, they were there for I mean, for forever. Um, my brother's been here about uh, eight years now, I think. And I think my mom got a condo here just shortly after that. Wow. So. So you just remodeled the basement. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's finished as it, of. Um, I mean, it's it's about eighty five percent there. Um, and you know, previously it had just sort of been a rec room for the previous owner. Yeah. And I turned it into a you know, I put all my gear down here and and worked out of it. Called it my studio. Right. Um, but then we had to do some renovations upstairs and. So long story short, I got to make some upgrades. Piggyback. Piggyback it. Yeah. I love a good piggyback. Yeah. So we added a, we added a, like a vocal booth, amp room and separated kind of a live room and control room. You can area. track drums and everything down there. Yeah. Yeah. What's this, what's the uh, noise level like upstairs? You can hear it, but it's, it's, I mean, we could have a, you could do a, probably a full band down here and it wouldn't if, if they were they could sleep on the second floor wow really yeah yeah i mean we we did we did like resilient channel and rock wool and wow. five drywall all of that so you did it properly i i probably i properly went overboard um <laughs> <laughs> on my on my basement that's great yeah well i mean in a town like nashville if you ever did decide to sell the house that's a, yeah. a pretty good feature to have. Yeah, right? it seemed it seemed like a, a good thing to have. Um, you know, it seemed like we weren't probably going to lose money on it. Right. Um, and half the reason we bought this house was that I had a spot in my in the basement that I could really work from. Right. And call it a monetizable space. You just go downstairs and make your money maker. But yeah. Yeah. So. We're just, you know, kind of investing in that. Uh, 
where were you before Nashville? I was in New York for about five years. Oh, really? And then, yeah. I didn't know. Um, yeah, we were, that's where my wife and I met in New York. And so after Loudermilk Gosling split up, I headed out there and was there for a bit and then came down here. What were you doing musically in New York? Um, I was, I worked a lot. I worked a lot with, um, with Craig Wedren. I'd kind of met him when I lived in LA. Is he the, and uh, Shutter to Think, yeah. the singer for Shutter to Think. And he does like film scores and stuff. So I worked with, I, he kind of would bring me in on stuff. Um, I got real lucky to, to work with him on, on some film scores and then Shutter to Think did a tour in 2008 and I got to play, I got to play guitar for that. Really? Um, yeah, that was really, really like a childhood dream come true. I did not know this. It was kind of, I think it was kind of under the radar. Um, they, they they recorded the, the tour and, and put a, a live record out um, maybe a year later. Yeah. But I was doing that and then I was doing, playing with the Rack and Tours during that time. The same time? Yeah. We literally were like kind of, Rack and Tours would have a break and it would just be right when Shutter to Think was going to be out. So I would leave one gig and go out to the next one. How was shifting gears like that? Was there, was was, there any like awkward transitional, like getting into the groove of being with a new group of people back and forth? Were you ping ponging? Yeah, but everything was new to me at that point. Like I was coming right off of having been in Loudermilk and Gosling, which was just, it was just the same thing day in and day out. Right. The shows were always the same and everything was was super rehearsed. So all of it was was brand new. So I don't actually have a good gauge for for whether it was chaotic or not because it all just sort of felt like, oh, we're, this is some this is all brand new to me. It was all deer in its moments. Yeah. Yeah. For a year. How do you deal with that with the pressure? You just preparation yeah i think so i think i just i think i probably like over prepped on a bunch of stuff and um just my my mo in life is just say yes i can do it and then figure out how to make that work right um so yeah it was just it was just a lot of like prepare and then realize that all the prepare, like all the preparation in the world is only good up to a certain point. Right. And then just sort of wing it. And, and it was like surfing for a year, you know, like just right. hope you stay on the board and <laughs> try not to fall off. So how the louder milk was associated with Shutter to Think in some way? Did you guys tour with them or play shows with them and that's how you met? No, no, it was, we we really just looked up to that band. Um, and- yeah, I look up to Iron Maiden and I've never gone on tour with them. <laughs> no, that was the Shutter to Think with thing was just a, a total kind of a fluke. We, we moved down to LA in probably 2000, We'd been down there making a record and then went back to the Northwest and then went back down to LA and um, met Adam Wade. Um, and he, we, we'd kind of met him a few times and hung out a little bit. Um, and then a friend of mine just sort of, I was hanging out with him and he's like, hey, I'm doing this thing and we're looking for a guitar player. Um, and it's me and this guy named Adam Wade. And it was, oh, okay, I know Adam. And, and he said, that they were looking for a guitar player. And I, th I thought, well, that would be fun to get to play some music with Adam Wade. That would be incredible. And he said, well, okay, cool. Well, the singer, Craig, I'll have to ask him. And then my jaw kind of hit the floor. It's like, Craig and Adam are playing? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I want to do that, you know? So that was a, a really like amazing moment. And did you audition or was it just like uh you got in on your on your buddy's word i don't really know i think maybe they had tried a couple people um 
I mean, I came, I came in kind of re just really cold. Um, I'd listened, I think, to some of Craig's solo stuff. It, they were doing Craig's solo stuff. And, um, and so I came in and learned, had learned maybe a few of those songs. And then him, like, he asked, like, do you know any, any of the Shutter to Think stuff? And I thought I did. Um, I was not prepared for how much I did not know. Right. But that was also just, you know, get, getting to be taught how to play some of that stuff was just bonkers. But not knowing it, it was so cool. a catastrophic crash and burn in that rehearsal setting. It, it was, you know, I, I knew the timing. I didn't, I, I was just not prepared for how, how like mechanical a lot of it was. Right. I, in my mind, I had, I had heard things and omitted things and, and, and Craig's ear is just incredible. He can, you know, he, he can hear things that I would never be able to pick out. Or well, that guy's amazing too. Yeah. He's a genius. So how long did that go on? Um, in 2000, I mean, probably I met him in 2005, maybe. Um, yeah, 2005 to 2008. I think we finished that tour in 2008 or nine. And I probably did a few more shows with him after that. And then he moved out to LA. Um, and I moved down here and we've, you know, Oh, kept in touch. So when you showed up in Nashville, was that how the Rack and Tours thing came together? No, that kind of that was kind of a, a weird fluke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything was a fluke. I've just sort of like stumbled into it. <laughs> um, Maybe yeah. I start drinking again. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, no, that was that was. Um, I think their their keyboard player Dean was on the road with Queens of the Stone Age and um, wasn't able to do that tour. And um, someone, a, a friend in LA had had recommended me for it. That's a good friend. And that was a very good friend. And I happened to be, Isaac and I were on tour with a, an artist named Jeremy Fisher at the time. I was playing bass and keys for him. And I was really like, I had committed to that guy for like three or four months of touring. Right. And, um, and got the call and had to turn it down. And Jeremy. A rack and tours down? I, yeah, I had to, I had to like say, oh, I'm on the, I'm on tour right now. And I would really would pull the rug out from under this guy if I, if I said yes. Right. But if there's any way to make it work in the future, I would love to, you know, have the call. Um, and I, I think I hung up the phone and Jeremy immediately said like, who is that? We were all like all at dinner together. And, and I said, oh, was, this is the band. Don't worry about it. I was like, no, right. who was it? I was the rock and tour. So you're fired. Call him back. And he, he just, really? yeah, just literally fired me so I could take the job. Really? Yeah. What a selfless fella. He was, I mean, you guys were on the road. Yeah. What did he do to recover? He, he's just, he's just an amazing guy and, uh, really he can make the show work by himself. Wait a minute. Is that who Isaac was out with when he was playing the little box? Yeah. So did they just change the show to Isaac playing the box and him playing acoustic I, what happened? Yeah, I think that whole tour was just sort of like him and Isaac and they they had had a keyboard player and then she had to leave to go back to Canada and they brought me in. I think they changed the show for a few shows and they brought me in and then I left and they just finished out the show or finished the the tour, just the two of them. So really you got that, I mean, you got the gig because you were recommended, highly recommended for it, but you turned it down but ultimately got it because of the generosity of him. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. A very good lesson in life. Um, yeah. And he's, huh. he's the best guy. 
What do you think would have happened if you hung up the, if you were like, yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. What the look on his face? Would he, he sounds like the kind of guy who would, would have the same reaction. His, you know, I, I think his takeaway that I, if I remember it correctly, his, um, his sort of way of dealing with it was like, look, if Neil Young called me right now, and said, I need somebody to open for me, just a guitar player. I just need a guy with a harmonica and an acoustic guitar. You and Isaac would be on the first bus home. Right. You know? So I need not G- even a plane. Yeah. I mean he was, you know, he was he was <laughs> maybe he was serious. I don't know. But um but his his um his philosophy was I need to do what's right for me. And the best thing for me to do is for you to do what's right for you too. You know, like it just made sense to him that everybody would just look out for themselves and and be as forthright with each other as possible. That's great. Which was, I mean, seemed like it worked for everyone. It certainly worked out for you. (laughs) How long did you, how long were you out with those guys? One for one tour? Yeah, it was just one tour. Yeah. I think I did a few shows here and there. Um, they did some shows in 2011. And I did some shows with them then. So you went from playing with Craig to essentially being out with the Rack and Tours. I'm a huge Brendan Benson fan. Yeah. Like, I'm, I think I'm probably a, a bigger Brendan Benson fan than I am a Jack White fan, though I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the White Stripes. Yeah. Um, Was that, was, did, was that any kind of weird pressure? I know you guys, you guys had been out. I mean, you were around Craig, you looked up to him. Mm -hmm. Had you guys been out and toured with anyone with that kind of star power before? We, yeah, we, I mean, we were toured with, yeah, we had, we, we didn't really get a lot of like main stage tours. We always ended up kind of like on the side stage. We did our first pro- proper tour was opening for Motley Crue and Megadeth. That's um, wait a minute, was, Motley Crue and Megadeth together. Yeah. When did that happen? It was 2000. Motley Crue had put out a record and they were doing this ultimate rock tour thing. And, and um, the, the main stage was Anthrax, Megadeth and Motley Crue. I think Anthrax just played a week or something and then ended up, I don't know why they ended up leaving the tour, but, um, but yeah, so we, we played this side stage. Um, we would play for about 45 minutes as people filed in Megadeth would play. And then we would do another set between Megadeth and Motley Crue. Really? Yeah. We had a lot of beer thrown at us, but um, really? <laughs> yeah, we didn't really belong on the tour. It was awesome. It was really, really fun. And just a, uh, the the kind of the best possible, like just throw them in the fire and see what happens. You know, it was it was really good. A great learning experience. You guys were a pretty intense live band. Like there was a lot of energy coming off the stage. And and it wasn't like it wasn't heavy music. What do you think didn't, wasn't connecting? Was it? I mean, I think, I think it was probably, I think a lot of it had to do with a misperception of what Anthrax and Motley Crue and Megadeth are versus right. what we were. Right. You no. Know? Like they're heavy bands with good songs, and I guess the thing that sets and, and, and you melodic. Apart, you guys had heavy... a front man that could sing. That's what set you apart. Maybe <laughs> Joey Belladon. I, mean, I like Joey Belladonna's vocals. But yeah, they you know they they were. But all of them are are fairly melodic bands as well. Right. You know. I think we probably just had something to, had more to do with the clothes we were wearing. Did you guys, were you guys that. doing the like uh, youth army look? Yeah, probably. Yeah. We had like, you know, silky button up shirts with ties and, and um, 
mod haircuts. Yeah. That's probably, that was what pissed him off. I probably. Fucking short hairs. Damn short hairs. That's right. But, um, but it was good. So we, yeah, we did that tour. We opened for Weezer for a while. Oh, that's sick. Um, but yeah, again, that was like a side stage thing. So they had a, like a main stage thing happening. And then you know, there was sort of like a back and forth, like Weezer dashboard confessional and Sparta on the main stage. And then us, um, a band called hometown hero and a band called AM radio on the side stage yeah. hometown hero then morphed over the years and became a wall nation. Is that right? Oh, that's kind of how Isaac ended up in a wall nation is we met Aaron on that tour. Huh? Huh? Hometown hero had kind of a Weezer thing going on, right? I, I, yeah, kind of. Yeah. In, in the like sense a, that it was like just really heavy, good pop. Yeah. You know, I want to circle all the way back and talk about what, how we ended up talking about being on this tour. Okay. But then I want to go back and talk about the beginning. So when, so it wasn't <laughs> like you were, you know, doe eyed when you showed up on the Rack and Tours bus. Right. But all of a sudden you're like, okay. I mean, did you rehearse or was it was it that someone dropped out in the middle of a tour and you came and No, we them? did I did like a month of rehearsals with them. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I did come in and, and have to, you know, I I I kinda I guess I auditioned for the for the role. Were uh, you more prepared? Did you over prepare? I don't remember. I think it was kind of like, yeah, we need somebody. Can you get here tomorrow? We, I, you know what? Actually, no. It was the weirdest thing because we were we were in Canada, we were in Toronto, our, and we got <laughs> we got snow. Like our show got canceled because of snow, and then we ended up we were flying to Nashville the next day to play at Third and Lindsley. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, that was sort of the thing was like, yeah, I'm actually going to be in Nashville tomorrow. I can, I can do it if you want me to, to audition. And so we came in, I had, we played that night and then the next day we had a day off. And so I just went and kind of jammed with them. How'd it go? And how, what was the vibe like the first, the first day? I don't remember. Really? No memory of it. <laughs> it it was. I, just... I remember going. I remember going to. Uh, I I think maybe Patrick picked me up, and took me down there, uh -huh. but I don't I don't fully remember. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we you know they were rehearsing in this kind of this warehouse studio thing, and and um. That it's now a, a it's a studio now, but um, I don't remember really what it was at the time. But they were rehearsing in there, and I think I went in went in for an hour, and we just kind of tried playing through some of the songs. And so you had just had the night to listen, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm not even sure I had a keyboard with me. I, I don't think I had anything with me to to prepare. Like all of our gear got stuck up in Canada. Uh, uh, I was so excited for these guys to come see the show because I knew like, oh, our drummer's insane and Jeremy's like such a great singer and and I'll have my keyboard and I'll be playing bass. Like they can really see that I can do a bunch of stuff. And then all of our gear got stuck in Toronto and just Jeremy and I came to Nashville. Isaac even got stuck in Toronto. Really? Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't let him on the plane. And I ended up playing Melodica for the whole show <laughs> which was you know the biggest letdown oh yeah here, here's the guy we're trying out tomorrow he's just playing this weird mouth whistle wait it's know. got key, uh, it's got keys right it does has key, have keys yeah there you go did you bring it to to your audition your i should have that would have been just so show you, capable of guys in a road case yeah <laughs> just it wheel it in <laughs> uh I think one, you know, one Mississippi, that record, uh, yeah. uncelebrated classic. Yeah. It probably in 1998, 
it probably got more spins by me than any other record. Yeah. Yeah, it's a an insanely good record. We oh. we like wore out multiple records of his on the road. Um just, you know, you always can hear something new every time you put it on. Right. No, it's a, yeah, it's a really densely uh produced record. Yeah. Who's that? Jason uh Faulkner, I think. Is it Right. Is that who produced it? I think that was I think that was Jason Faulkner. That guy is great too. Or was it I I I can't remember this point. Or did John Bryan? Or, or did he do La Palco? I can't remember. But I don't know. They're all a bunch of fancy guys. Yeah. They do a bunch of fancy good work. I know I know Brendan worked with with Jason Faulkner on. It was that record then. Yeah. Cuz the record that Jason put out shortly after was great also that author unknown album mm. yeah so we'll talk about what happened after that tour okay later. but was what was your first instrument because you also play violin is that right yeah that was kind of the first thing my parents made me do oh it's just they put me in violin um when i was itty bitty and that was sort of the the thing that I had to do. Were you a, like a kid virtuoso? I don't think so. I mean, I hope not. <laughs> Cause right. I, I, I would feel like at this point, I would feel like, yeah, you've really let your parents down. <laughs> let everybody down. <laughs> wasted. Just wasted it. All that, all that lesson money. Yeah. $15 a week. Yeah. Go. 15 bucks, 15 bucks a month, son. Pay it back. Um, <laughs> That's why they're so mad at me. Um, uh, so when did you start playing the violin? Uh, I must have been almost four, three or four. They started, I started on a, a, a little cigar box, like, a, you know, like, like one of these little things. And they taped a ruler to it. And I would hold that under my chin and practice handling it. Really? Yeah. That's what um, they do. Yeah, well, and, and with kids that young, I think that's just sort of the first thing you teach them is how to not drop it. Right. And then how to not destroy an expensive acoustic instrument. Yeah, there was just a lot of like, okay, here's the here's the the bow. What part are you allowed to touch? You can touch this part, and you can touch this part, and you can touch this part, but don't touch the hair. You know. Right. It was just a lot of songs about, you know what to do and what not to do before you even get to play a note. That's kind of life, right? That's yeah. <laughs> if, if only there was like songs like that for taxes. Okay, uh, have you gotten like fiddle work since you showed up in Nashville? Can you play that? A style? little bit, a little fiddle. Um, not much though. I'm not, I'm not like, not your style. I'm just, I, I think probably when I was in my late teens, I probably could have done that, but, um, wow. Car alarm going off out there. Um, a rough neighborhood. Yeah. But, uh, do you play other stringed instruments? You play cello or viola or anything? Nah, no, I no. wish I did. Um, I've played, I've played them, you know, from time to time. Um, like on a, you know, recording for a friend or something when I've got time that I can kind of just sit down and figure out how to make it work. Right. But I would never say that I could play those instruments. Right. When did you pick up a second instrument? Um, I think I was five. I started doing piano. Um, that was kind of five years old. You were a multi instrument. <laughs> Well, I could probably pay, play Mary Had a Little Lamb on both. That's um, pretty good. But yeah, I think I was, we, I just, it was one of those houses that just had instruments laying around everywhere. That was kind of what we did in, in our house. My parents both played multiple instruments. And oh, really? So I just kind of watched them doing that growing up. They played key like piano and violin and what else uh well my mom my mom 
uh, was my mom taught piano at a, a college and and then also played harp and then my dad um played your mom plays the harp yeah how weird is that that's rad yeah does she pretty... still have one yeah she's got a couple she's got one in washington and then she's got one out here in nashville like it's just the, the big six foot crazy things that i'm afraid to touch um that's incredible yeah she used got to a standing <laughs> piano yeah with the with the pedals and everything that just freaks me out oh that's sick yeah it's like a like a stand-up pedal steel right crazy wow. but yeah so she plays that my and my dad my dad played organ and and clarinet stand-up bass he, he like both of them just kind of if you handed them an instrument they could make it do something right so you, said you have a brother I have a brother. Does he also play music? He does. He plays bass and he's a an excellent uh, piano player and guitar and he jumps all over the place too. Is he gigging? Nope. He, uh, I mean, he does, he does from time to time, he'll, he'll play shows. Um, mostly he, he works at Groon Guitars. Oh. He works, he works in the, in the repair shop there. Yeah. And he's in he's in school right now, but he's been doing guitar repair for the last probably fifteen years. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's a pretty good place. Yeah, <laughs> it's a uh, good on him. <laughs> you gotta know your way around fixing a thing. Yeah. So when did you pick up the guitar? Probably. I think I wanted a guitar. For, I mean, I grew up in the '80s. Who didn't want a guitar in the 1980s? Sure. You know, um, so I probably asked for Christmas for a few years, and then finally, when I think when I was 10, uh, they got me uh, a Unisynth. I don't know if you remember these, but it was a uh, it was a rubber fretboard. Oh. And fake rubber strings, like touch sensitive rubber fretboard and then there was a kind of a little strike plate with six wound oh, strings okay. on it yeah and i think there was a midi port on it but i never figured out how to use that it had a little built-in speaker and a whammy bar and you could there was a, a guitar sound and a piano sound and a harpsichord sound it just was weird were you but, able to make music sounding sounds on it uh debatable yeah um <laughs> there... i think if i had one now it would probably be like it would be one of those things that you keep in the studio because at some point somebody's going to pick it up and go this is you know this is insane let's you know let's put some fuzz on it or something right it probably would have been a really really awesome cheap like parlor trick yeah maybe a parlor or or maybe it would be like like those those early casio keyboards are just incredible now like i yeah. I hear those now and I'm like, why did, were these not just in every studio? Why did not people not just cherish these? Um, Cause they weren't, you know, there wasn't a nostalgia for it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think at this point in time, it, it would be um, a lot cooler than I think it was back then. You should find one on eBay. I, should. I bet you can get one for a hundred bucks. I bet. So how long before you broke it and got a, a real guitar? I think I, I think I played around on that for maybe a year. And then I think I mowed some lawns and saved up and bought myself a harmony. And, and then that was kind of off, not off to the races. I, I, I played around on that. I, I actually, I had a band in like junior high we played maybe one or two shows and then that band split up and I wanted to start something else and ended up playing drums because I didn't know anybody that played drums. So I, I did the drum thing for years. Well, not, I say years. It felt like years. It was maybe two years. I played drums. Time feels like a lot longer when, when you're 14, kid. 15. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I did like a couple years playing drums in bands before, um, 
I met Davey and Isaac and really started hanging out with them. And then, and then I just ended up joining Loudermilk. So they were, they were an existing, they were a three piece. Yeah. They were a three piece for maybe eight, eight or nine months. Um, Crazy. They were, they were playing shows like where our bands would play shows together. Um, yeah. I mean, just sort of kind of fell into place. Well, what was the thing that made you most excited about getting a guitar? Like what were the, the was, bands and the music that, that got you excited and, and made you sort of like not turn your nose up at the violin, but. I think, I think it was, I didn't, I didn't ever really want to play violin. That was sort of like the, the, the expectation. Yeah, it was the expectation and like in, in the way that like a lot of, you know, families are like, oh, you're going to go out and you're going to do, you have to do your chores. You have to do the yard work. You have to, you know, right. help me paint the fence. Um, that was, was what it was. It was just sort of the, this is the par for the course in this house. You're going to play an instrument. Um, and I think it was, that's how it felt. That was my parents' way of, I think they saw that, okay, he's got a bit of an aptitude for figuring things out by ear. So the only person that'll train a kid by ear is the violin teacher in town. Right. And so I think they just didn't want that to kind of slip away. But, um, but I think, you know, what I, I think I just wanted to play music with other people. And the guitar was the clear in to do that. Right. Um, you are a parent now. Yep. Are you, um, you have a daughter? Mm -hmm. You're going to hammer your daughter with violin lessons? What's that? You're going to hammer your daughter with violin lessons? I don't think so. She's just starting to get interested in, in piano and teach herself some songs. Um, and she's, you know, She's at the point right now where she's she really wants to do it herself. She's really, really self, uh, super self-involved, just as kids are. No, she 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 wants to do everything herself, and you know she's just proud of herself when when she figures it out. And if you interfere at all, if I interfere and say actually it's that note, it's it's all over. She loses interest. Right. So, I you know right now it feels like the best thing I can do for her is just let her guide herself. And hopefully if, you know, if it's in the cards, it'll, she'll, she'll keep at it. And then maybe I will give her some lessons at some point. Family band. Family yeah. band. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Do you think that there is, I mean, your mom was playing while she was pregnant with you. Yeah, probably. Um, and so you were hearing music before you had ever been introduced to the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has an effect? Maybe. Do you ever study any of that stuff? I, I, you know, I've, I, I kind of always just chalked it up to kids mimic what they see. Right. And I just was from a house where someone was always practicing something. Both my parents sung in choirs and my mom would, you know, play piano in the, in the, for the church choir or organ for the church choir. They were always practicing some, if not many, many different pieces of music. So there was just sort of, it just kind of felt like that's the fabric of, of what people do. Right. Crazy. So I don't know if it was mimicry or if it was, you know, picking something up. A little of both. Bloom, you know. A little of both, maybe. maybe. Could be. When you joined Louder, so your band that played with Louder Milk was a, mm -hmm. was a rock band. That Louder Milk was a rock band. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a rumor that Louder Milk started as a either a like I've heard different stories either a Motley Crue cover band or so, <laughs> there's that there is that rumor that um 
that yeah our 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 publicist really liked the story it's, there's a there's a sliver of truth to the story which is when Isaac and Shane were 11 10 and 11 I think right around the time I first met Isaac I think I met Isaac when I was 12 and Isaac was 10 right and and they they had they started playing Guns N' Roses covers among other covers with some friends from their neighborhood and uh a friend that was booking shows for a, a, a local fair, I think, heard them practice and he booked them to play on a side stage and they needed a name. So they called themselves 22s and Tulips as a joke. Right. And and then never did it again. They they had their own band called Empty Handed after that. And and it was all all their own songs. But I think there was, you know, a single show where they played Guns N' Roses covers, but it had nothing to do with like Davey and I weren't there for that. Right. Um, Got it. But it made it made for a really good story. So that's what the Wikipedia will say. <laughs> you know, is that is that actually on the Wikipedia? I believe so. That's just uh, I just remember hearing that back when you when you know like the during the groundswell in Seattle. Yeah. Like it was sort of being said then. Yeah. Yeah, our 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 publicists really like loved the the that innocence and the, you know like, like oh it's so like there, there, it's something to talk about you know right and I know if we we just kind of well I guess so it doesn't feel like it's kind of true okay what, so what was the arc of the early arc of that band like once you joined the band. You're how old? I was 18. You were 18. Yeah. Isaac is 16. So it's like, yeah. it's two years before you guys get signed. Yeah. And what's the vibe like around the band in the Tri-Cities? Because that's where you live. Like you're a senior in high school or you're just graduating? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I was just about to graduate. Um, it was... So they were they were established, and they had probably played. I mean, maybe like eight or nine shows in our hometown, and and they had definitely had a uh, like a rising thing. And I was just stepping out of a band that that had had some small town hometown success you know the local radio station played us man right and and um and so yeah i think i think outside of the band we just we just kind of felt like kids we we just wanted out of town we just wanted to do something outside of our hometown and take we just wanted to keep climbing the the thing see see what we could do um, how frustrating was it? I mean, Isaac was two years younger than everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you guys, you guys couldn't leave town till he graduated high school. Yeah. And well, we spent, we spent the first year just making a record. I joined the band and pretty much, I'm not even sure I played a show with the band until the record was pretty much done. Um, that was the band with gun. Yeah. Yeah. The first record. Um, yeah. We went up to, to Seattle on the weekends for a full year. Who did and, you record with? Uh, Brian Holston. He lived in a house with Jade Devitt from Lucky Me and Engine Kid. Right. Yeah. Jade and, and Brian and then Matt LaSalle. Um, they're all Tri Cities guys. And they just had, they had this house and they had a cool, really cool basement, like studio. I've had a bunch of Tri-Cities people on the podcast, you know. There's a, it's a weird, there's something in the water and it's called radiation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there, so Brian, Brian recorded us. He did, he did, I think he also recorded the band. The band had done like three demos prior yeah. to me being in the band, so Brian just sort of got the band and knew what to do. 
we've already sort of touched on it where a year before you know before you're 20 or 21 they're like dog years it feels like seven years you could have you could have had a job for three months and it's just like oh god it felt like you were ready to retire that yeah i've been here so long (laughs) um but the idea of going without isaac probably wasn't it was the furthest thing from anyone's mind he was such a like a force in that music he was a, a real yeah driving i don't character. i don't think there was ever even a moment that we thought about that you probably that, would have waited five years yeah yeah it would have just isaac was you know at that point in time isaac and dave were the core of the band right it was they they were the 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 driving force and it took the two of them to to move it forward what I want to know is what God, Isaac is such an intense guy. It was a it was really amazing to get to to play shows with him because yeah. he is a ferocious hard hitter. Um and detail oriented. Yeah. What was it like in that room? Who who was the drill sergeant on rehearsing? Um, because that band was was like, that band was a machine. All of us were really, um, I think we all had our, our things that we, that we took care of, you know, it didn't, it never felt like, it never felt like one drill sergeant. Isaac was, Isaac was very, very, Isaac was sort of like he and Shane would get together and and isaac would just like okay we gotta link up here 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 nope we gotta do it again you know he would he would really like make that thing the rhythm section happen and and then davy and i did that with each other for for guitar but it really it really felt i don't remember it ever feeling like there was one person cracking the whip right i mean especially when we lived in seattle Isaac and I would would get together an hour, two hours before rehearsal just to play songs together, just to like, you know, let's just get our, our brains going, you know? So we would just play covers. We would just, you know, play through Pinkerton front to back or play through a rentals record or something, you know? Right. Just to, just to be on the same page. That's great. We kind of just lived and breathed it for a long time. The energy, when did you guys end up showing up in Seattle? Cause I don't ever, I don't remember you guys being there for very long. We, we moved, I guess the band kind of relocated from Tri-Cities in uh, 98, I think fall of 98. And I moved up, Shane and I moved up to, to Bellingham. So we were in Bellingham for a bit. Um, and then kind of labels started sniffing around and we ended up coming down to Seattle. Were you and going then, to school? Yeah, I went, to, I was going to, to Western. Um, and I think Shane's girlfriend was, was up there doing that as well. So we, he, he and I would, would drive down five nights a week to Seattle um really? yeah we were we were just back and forth constantly you were driving down five nights a week and going to school probably i didn't sleep much that year what were your grades like they were terrible right i didn't want to be there but i was doing it right um you know it was like i knew i i was at that age where i was certain that this was going to be the thing that was going to happen for me and 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 I was also had parents that that really wanted me to go to school and they were really generous and wanted to help me go to school. So it felt like, well, I better do this because I've got this leg up, but it felt like I was just spinning my wheels. Yeah, I was spinning my wheels there and I was wasting their money and it just felt like, you know. How long after you, you guys were over on the West side 
of the Cascades mm. before you knew that, you know, you were going to, it was going to work. It was going to happen. I don't know. It, it felt, it felt pretty imminent from a, an early age. And I, well, from, from pretty early in the band. Right. Um, but we were also just cocky enough to think that something was obviously going to happen for us. Well, you kind of have to have that kind of belief in yourself, right? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I fucking bother. We did a, we did a, we did a show in our hometown. Uh, uh, Sugar Ray played when that single "I Just Want to Fly" yeah came out. They did a, they did, a, they were on tour. It was them. Spoon and Swerve Driver. What? What a bill. <laughs> and they played the fairgrounds and they we opened the show. And we still lived in the Tri Cities. And but we left that we left that show and maybe a few weeks later I got a call from the head of AR at Swerve Driver's label. They had sent him the record. And he just wanted to talk, see what we, you know, what, what are, you know, what were things like for us? And I think we were still waiting for Isaac to, to graduate. And so it just, it, it kind of, at that point, it felt like, oh, okay, there's a, there's a path here. Right. Um, and so, yeah, Seattle, I think we were there maybe six months before we started doing the whole thing with you know going out to dinners and and meeting people and free dinner is pretty sweet though that was pretty sweet it was nice nothing tastes better than a free dinner <laughs> let me tell you what <laughs> but um but yeah it just you know it it felt like you know i don't i don't want to i don't want to pretend that we were we were we were young and we didn't have anything better to do than just sit in a you know practice room and practice all the time well there was you know? nothing better to do that was the there wasn't that was no. the thing there you wasn't. guys were meant to be doing at that time yeah and we could have been out drinking but none of us drank at the time we right. were all we were all pretty you know fairly straight edge right um and so yeah i mean i guess i guess that was also sort of the the thing that made it happen, which was there, there wasn't anything else to do. Wow. It was just, there was just the band. Do you recall what it was? I mean, was there, was there a bidding war or, or a, where a point where you had multiple offers on the table and you had to decide which route to go? There were, you know what, there, there was a lot of, I think from the outside, it looked like a bidding war. Um, I, there were a lot of labels. I mean, we, we went out and we, we met with a, most of the majors, I think. I don't know. Um, I don't have a, a real clear memory of, of who all and where all we went. But um, American was the, probably one of the, if not the first, one of the first labels that started sort of courting us and i think a lot of the other labels saw our age and the fact that we'd never actually toured before and we had one record under our belt um but we were you know we re literally were children and i think that scared a lot of them off but american um dino and george uh just kept coming to the shows. They, they just stuck it out. What was, and you guys made your record with George. Yeah. For, uh, for anyone that's listening, George, I, is his name pronounced Draculius? Yeah. Who has made a bunch of records that I love. Yeah. Including yours. Well, thank you. Um, but your record is a lot different from <laughs> most of the other records that he's made. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. What is the next heaviest record that, what is the heaviest record he's ever made? I don't, I, I wouldn't, I don't know. I think we or I, like Tom Petty, the Black Crows. Yeah, I mean, it might be it might be Black Crows. Right. Southern Harmony is a pretty like wild pretty wild ride. Yeah. So it might it could be that. That's maybe the of the things I can think of. It's that's like maybe the most like energy-wise the most chaotic. Um we really knew what we wanted to do and what that record was going to sound like before we met them we were we were demoing with brian holston in seattle and we knew what the end product was going to sound like um what you wanted it to sound like well yeah what we wanted it to sound like and we I don't, I don't think I, I'm really proud of the way that record turned out. What I don't think we did was play to our strengths during the make, during the making of that record. I mean, we, we got signed because we were a, 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 a decent live band. Yeah. And we, everything on that record was, was individually tracked. Right. We, we tracked everything live and then we replaced everything. Right. Every single shred of music. There's nothing from the live takes that I can think of um, that remained in the end. We just, just exhausted. Even if it was it. good. It was it what? Even if it was. Even if it was good, it, it, it couldn't be good because we hadn't. Labored exhausted. over it. We hadn't labored over it. It was like, oh, no, no, no. We did 65 takes of the song. Uh, it's got to be, you know, there's definitely something usable in there, but no we had to go ahead, go through and, and, and pull our hair out over every single tone. And that record you guys made in, in 2000. Yeah. So it's a pro tools record. It was, it was a hybrid record. We did all the drums, most, all of the drums and the vocals were done on tape. And then guitars, I think most of the guitars were done uh, in Pro Tools. But there was a lot of like record it, bounce it to Pro Tools. There was a lot of a lot of chopping. Wow. And and moving things around. Whose decision was that? Like collectively your your own? I don't it wasn't I don't remember it being ours. I, I think we we liked having the option. But um, I mean, we, def we definitely loved having, having that tool there. Um, but I think it was just, it was, it was 2000 and everything was, was going into Pro Tools. Right. So we, I mean, we had Sylvia Massey engineered the drums on the record. Oh, really? Yeah. I think she was actually initially probably brought in to make the record and then it became apparent that we weren't willing to keep any of the live guitars. And so Joe Barisi then came in and engineered all the guitars on the record. Jesus. It was a, it was a big, it was an expensive record. Wow. You got um, but yeah, I mean, we had, we probably had four or five Pro Tools guys working on the record as well. <laughs> tuning things like you know where did you guys track uh where didn't we <laughs> we we started at um we started at sound city right studio a and spent maybe a month and a half there and then you we moved. spent a lot of money on this record it was ridiculous and it was it was you know it sounds i mean i i still listen to this record once a month this That's 20 amazing. years on, 20 years on, I listen to it once a month. Um, and it still gets me excited, <laughs> you know? Well, it, I'm, I'm glad it does that. It, it, the thinking back, looking back on it, you know, hindsight being 2020, I don't, I don't know 
how we weren't seeing the writing on the wall. That you know, the, one of the first things Dino Paredes, who was our A&R at, at, at uh, American said to us was, we will give you enough rope to hang yourself. Right. You know, when we asked him, what do you you're like, what's, what are you going to give us? He said, we'll give you enough rope to hang yourself. And that's exactly what we did. Right. We, we made a record that we could ne- that could never recoup. And because of that, we, that we got shelved by the label. I don't know that that was necessarily the way it went, but there was, you know, we didn't get off to a good start with them right. just simply because we didn't, we didn't know how to manage ourselves. We didn't know how to, we weren't necessarily, we weren't, I don't think we were, you were born. ready to let a producer really, we were boys, we were children. We weren't ready to let a producer tell us how we were most effective. Right. You know, we're, uh, we, couldn't, we a, couldn't see past ourselves. Was it a collective, like, and I don't, you know, you don't have to throw anyone under the bus, but was it a collective mentality? Like you guys all thought you knew exactly what was right. Like you had a unified vision and a producer, no producer was going to come in and. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we probably just spent so much time with each other. Right. That we were, you know, we were a little gang of. I mean, there's something to be said about like, if you look at it from one angle, that's that's young people being precious about their music in a way that they they don't know how to translate it to a wider audience right mm-hmm. but on the other hand it is a very focused unit who fuck maybe you're right i mean yeah. i think i i think the the record definitely turned out being as close to what we initially imagined as possible I mean, we, we got really, really, really lucky and blessed that we had George in our corner. Because even if we weren't listening to his ideas, even if we weren't letting him actively produce, and he was, he was actively producing, but, but some of that was like stepping out of the room, letting us go down the wormhole and right. then coming back in. Um, but for you know for what it's worth i think we did you know make make the record we initially set out to make it just took forever man <laughs> have you crossed paths with him since then oh yeah 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 you have yeah uh, and what is that is it cool it's oh yeah no he's the great he's the like the sweetest guy in the world he he's he, not like oh look at you all grown up well probably yeah i mean <laughs> we were is he an LA guy? Was he always from LA? Do you know? Uh, no, he's he's a New York guy. Oh, okay. Um, I think he and and Rick were both New York, right? Dudes, um, and then transplanted to LA. Was Rick around for any of your guys' recording? He, no, not not for any of the recording. Never. He he um he kind of let like my understanding was that that. Dino and George really like we were their project. Did you so, ever meet him? Yeah, we met him a few times. He came, we we did some demos when we were first kind of meeting the label and sniffing each other out. Um, and he came, he came down uh while we were in LA making some demos for them and hung out and showed us some some chili peppers stuff and made us made us feel special. Right. You know, that was rad. Uh, that's cool. That was when John had come back, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they were. It was the he he was making Californication. I think at that point. Right. So that was a, that is a big sad. deal. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, how the record came out two thousand one? I think two thousand two. Two. Yeah. We made the record. I saw you guys at South by Southwest in two or three, right? Okay. Yeah. 
So you were at the Pleasure Club show then. It was an upstairs show. Yeah. So the band that played right before us uh, was a band called Pleasure Club. And I've never in my life felt dumber than having to walk on stage and play music after that band. Really? They, they were and continue to be one of the sickest bands I've ever, ever, ever seen. Um, and their singer, James Hall, I actually was at a show of his two nights ago. Well, they're a ago. New Orleans band. Yeah, yeah. Half the band was New Orleans. Half the band was L.A. Right. And yeah. Just an that, that is a monster band, of a band. That is a band that musicians, that doesn't get their due, but every, yeah. all musicians love. Yeah. Huh. So yeah, they played right before us and and um that was terrifying to have to follow them. You guys were and always were on fire though. We probably we probably felt like we had to be that night. <laughs> you know, we were... you did a thing on stage with your with your amps and your cabinets that I I tried and it never worked for me. But I'm curious as to why if it was purely aesthetic or if there was a sonic quality to what you were doing, but you had your heads and in, in road cases mm -hmm. and they were on the stage and then you put your cabinets on top of them. Yeah. And it looked killer. But when I tried to do that, it sounded, I didn't like the way it sounded for, for my thing. You guys right. sounded great, but there was something about the disconnection of the cabinet and the, was that just so you could hear yourself? Um, yeah, I think it was, my recollection is, is probably it was something that our sound guy talked us into. We, we had Bill, Bill. I don't know if it was Bill Neiman that talked us into doing this. Maybe it was our manager. We knew we had to get road cases because we were going on tour. And um, I think it was, we, if you'd ever been in the room when we played, we just didn't have any, if you said that's too loud guys, we just would go louder. Right. One louder. Um, we didn't, we didn't have any, any, uh, any time for, for someone telling us to turn down. We just couldn't physically do it. And I think that was maybe uh, a, a a slick trick that somebody pulled to get us to get the the cabs out of the audience's face, right? And up up at head level for us. Oh, that makes sense. Um, still, just have one cabinet. So it, it's you know, for people listening to give you a visual, basically, if your if your amplifier is inside of a road case, you can put your cabinet up on top of that, it lifts it up higher so you can, you know, a lot of sound gets pushed out just right past your ass. Yeah. Especially if a stage isn't big. If if it's, you know, if your cabinet's back 10 or 15 feet, it's great because the sound yeah. has a chance to develop and, and spread out, but. Yeah, but if you're on a shallow stage, you, it doesn't go anywhere. Just goes straight into the audience's face. Right. What were you using back then? I, um, I feel you guys weren't using mesas, were you? No, no. Davey was, um, JMP? For the, no, for the most part, yeah. Davey had a JMP one, the same and one thing. of those Marshall Power amps. That's like um, Deftones rig. Yeah, yeah. That thing was ungodly loud and for really us. sounded really, really sounded good. And then I, I've always kind of been a Rivera guy. Um, so I had a, the amp I played the other night, that, that uh, Rivera knucklehead. Same one. It's the same one. Um, that was kind of the first amp I bought in the band. And then, um, and then I bought a, a bonehead. Like a, is that like a hot rod Marshall kind of a sound or? Yeah, kind of actually. Paul Paul Rivera modded that one, the one I have. So it's it's a, a little higher gain than than the the standard hundred watt knucklehead from from that era. Um, 
but it's you know it's just it's two channels one one's sort of a fender style the other other is a uh, i think my my understanding is that the 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 channel one is like a super champ oh wow um 100 so like, watt super champ yeah it's a 100 watt super champ it, it just it's like a a, a screaming fender kind right. of circuit and then the other one is more of a marshall circuit and then each each channel has a boost to it so there's a lot of different tonal options right and then after that i had a, a rivera bonehead which was the fender channel and then two marshall channels each with a boost and you could get even more tones out of that. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my rig for the longest time. Did you use that during Gosling? Yeah. You did, same. Yep. Davey switched to an AC30. Yeah. Yeah, I always kind of just stayed with that thing because it was, um, you could get a lot out of that, out of that, that amp in particular, that bonehead, you could get a lot of different tones out of that. Right. So when the record was out, you guys go out on tour. That's when you guys did the Motley Crue thing. Yeah. The anthrax thing. Well, I toured with Motley Crue. It was, it was pretty awesome. But unfortunately when, by the time we played with them, which was a few years after you. Yeah probably six, seven years after you. Tommy was mailing it in a bit. Yeah. It was a, that was sad. Because yeah. I, really, I wish I could see the band like really going for it. I I yeah. saw the band as a, as a audience member on fire, but you know. Yeah, we were, Tommy wasn't playing with them at the time they had Samantha Maloney was playing drums. Oh, rad. Yeah. And she was just incredible. Have um, you watched Count Me In? No. Do you know what it is? I don't. It's a, no, a Netflix documentary about drummers and she's featured in it. Oh. And she talks about her experience. Like she's, you know, she's doing the whole thing and they, she's maybe home and gets the call and amazing. Boom, like she goes into the whole thing. It's great. That sounds awesome. Yeah, I definitely want to see that. Oh, that's that's great. I didn't see them. I didn't get a chance to see them then. Yeah, they were they were at the at the time having grown up being being a a Motley Crue fan. Yeah. It felt like, oh, uh, well like we're seeing Motley Crue. It's not totally Motley Crue without without Tommy. Right. But but really like you knew that she was putting more into it every night than than he was going to right yeah unfortunately which is in you know in a weird way nice to know nice to at least know like i have a philosophy about music which is if i don't think that i'm gonna like if i don't think that i'm gonna actually like be up for doing this like if you told me yeah you're not gonna get paid for tonight Am I going to perform any differently? Right. You know, or, you know, like if, if I'm only doing it cause there's a paycheck involved or if, or if it just, it music, no matter what it is, deserves to be made by someone who's willing to bleed for it. And paycheck is pretty nice though. It's, it's really nice, but <laughs> let's not downplay getting paid. Because... No, 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 no. I'm not, not trying to downplay that, but We've but, done a lot and not made money. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think what's, what's good for, what's going to be good for the person paying you is going to be good for you. Right. So if I'm, if I'm showing up to the guy who's paying me and, and I'm like, yeah, I guess we'll do that thing tonight. You know, and if, if I'm phoning it in for that person, I'm, I'm ruining the future of, I'm contributing to the ruin of the thing that's paying me versus right. if I, if I know, if I don't take the job because I know I'm not going to give it everything every night. Right. Then like, if I just only take jobs, only take work that I know I want to be doing this, I would probably do this if there wasn't a paycheck involved. Um, then, then you, 
you know that you're contributing to the success. You know that you're like helping the success of this thing every night. Right. Rather than being the weak link. So let me ask you this. You are not 20. No. You're old anymore. 23. You're 23. 23. You, you aged in negative dog years. <laughs> I went up and then I come right back down. Negative dog years. Yep. Uh, every seven years is one. Mm -hmm. Are you, have you turned 40 yet? Yeah, I'm you're 43. 40. You're 43. Yeah. So you, there are louder milk shows coming up. Yeah. Three of them. Three. Yeah. I'm still trying to, I'm I, like, I'm still struggling. I've, I've, I've kind of had this idea in my head. I don't know why I'm, I would want to make it hard for myself because I live in Albany. It's, yeah, it's essentially like living in, or out, that's my airport. I don't yeah. live in Albany, but it's essentially like having Spokane as your airport. Yeah. So for me to fly from Albany to, to Spokane probably yeah. is two connections, which is terrible. But for some reason, seeing you guys play in Spokane is what I have stuck in my head. Yeah. I think in my mind, it would be the easiest one. It would be the least stressful. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I think that's going to, I think all the shows are going to be re really fun. Spokane is the one that I feel like is going to be like, okay, this, this is the one where the wheels might pop off. Is Just because, no, it's the, it's the second. Oh, I have a feeling we're gonna feel very controlled about the Seattle and the Tri Cities show. That we're gonna like, okay, these are the two shows that we need to be really clinical about. Right. And the Spokane, I think the Spokane one. Um, hey, they got iPhones. Like, they got iPhones in Spokane. They got they got iPhones too. But <laughs> but yeah, that like that to me feels like the one that that it in no way is it a throwaway show, but but just a, a little more like relaxed a little more relaxed it, it's going to feel a little more like a hometown show without being a hometown show how do you feel about playing that music again after so long and have you started rehearsing yeah i've i'm kind of like when there's no one else in the house crank the amp up and 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 play i'm th this week and next week are my two like crunch um crunch weeks um yeah i've i've been playing through it it's really really fun to revisit because it's, it's very different from everything you've done since then it's yeah more aggressive yeah probably more technical and like it leans forward a lot more than anything you've done since right yeah i mean it's the Brendan Benson stuff probably is closest technical wise. Right. Like the Brendan stuff I was doing, I was multi instrumental for him. So yeah, I was hopping around to a lot of different things. And, and, and so this, it feels a little more like that. Do you, what are you going to do about, you used to have that Yamaha piano. Yeah. Do you have that in the tri city still? No, it's here in Nashville. So that's not going to make the trip. It's not going to make the trip. I I'm might trying to be find able, one. I might be able to find you one. I might, I might know, I might the, know a guy. The trick is going to be getting it to the tri cities to rehearse and then getting it back to Seattle or wherever it needs to go. You know, Well, is Pete going to be down there? Cause you could rehearse well, with a, I yeah, can rehearse, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that might it's... be might be the trick. Hmm. All right. Let me see what yeah. I might be able to help you out, my friend. No, oh, well, same. Huh? Yeah, because we 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 start in Seattle, we end in the Tri Cities. But yeah, I don't. I'm still trying to figure out. I know that there's one floating around in the Tri Cities. Right. There's a, a few floating around in the Tri Cities that um may may be up for grabs you just got to find those people so how when do you guys start rehearsing and how many rehearsals will you take we'll do so we start on the 26th 
So we'll do the 26th, 27th, 28th, and maybe the 29th. So we do like three or four rehearsals. Um, and then the, the show is the 30th, first show. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be really fun. Is it true that you guys didn't put the vinyl out before because it sounded like trash? I never said that. Nabil said that. Uh, <laughs> Nabil said he made some, but he said vinyl in general just didn't sound very good back then, and you guys didn't approve it. And yeah, there was there were um, there was some problems in the in back then. Mastering. We, from C yeah. First, 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 first of all, I think we we were going from the from the the. the the record masters we weren't using the the final mixes right. we were kind of trying to print vinyl from the the cd masters right and there wasn't much you could do i don't think you know 20 years ago there wasn't much you could do to get you know to get that stuff to even work on on vinyl i remember i remember davy and i playing it and um and there was just this like high fizzle on everything. And I don't know if that was a, I don't know if that was a, 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 a trick that they, they, you know, something they put in there to, to kind of offset the digital clipping or whatever that was going on. Right. But um, I mean, it was, you know, 98, 99, 2000. It was like the loudness wars and everything was just hard limited. It just looked like somebody took a Sharpie and <laughs> did right. a big black band if you looked at the waveforms. Uh, how many records have you made since the first record you made with Louder Milk? And what is, um, your, what is your mindset? How is it different now from then? Cause it was pretty intense then. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have no idea how many records I, I've, I mean, I think more than, more than anything, I kind of contribute here and there to records. I'm not, I'm not rarely there for front to back. Right. But I mean, Do you contribute to the, we, ha, we haven't even mentioned the fact that you uh, are playing with the shins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've yeah. Pretty good. So, yeah. I, pretty lucky. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've gotten to contribute to, to um, the, the last, the last record the band put out. Yeah. I joined on, um, I joined the band on the tour for, uh, Port of Moro, which was 2012, and then made Heartworms in in 17. So yeah, I played a lot of guitars on that record and keys and stuff. How did that come together? Um, joining that band? Yeah. Uh, they had the same manager as the Raconteurs. That's fancy. So Ian just is like my... He was has sort of been a guardian angel. Um, just, you know, there were a few years where I would just kind of get a, like every six months I'd get a email from him saying, how are you? What are you doing? Do you need work? Wow. Here's the thing that came across my desk. And he tried for a few years to get, to get me to meet James. I think he just felt like there was something there um, yeah. that we would hit it off. And then he called he called me in 2012, they were doing Coachella and said, hey, Shins needs somebody to play lap steel for one song. Can you, can you do it? I said, yeah, sure. He said, cool, cool, cool. Um, bring your violin and bring a guitar. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I thought I was doing one song. He said, just, just learn the whole set and don't leave the stage. Did you rehearse with them? I did. Uh, so there was a warm-up show. Okay. I think he just, I think he just felt like, like Jess, the guitar player, um, who is 
insanely talented and has um, her her band, uh, Deep Sea Diver, is just ridiculous. Um, and that's like her thing. And and um, and like she she was putting a record out. I think they just knew she's about to launch and and I think I ended up sort of being a insurance policy it's in case she needed to 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 do her thing Did um you? yeah yeah and she's like in fact Yuki and and Patty from the Shins are out with her right now uh -huh. um helping helping her she just made, put out a new record and and they're doing shows with her um that yeah it, it was you know just got i'm just a lucky guy i just got really really lucky do you think that it's that. luck i mean you've worked so. hard you show up prepared except for when you didn't know the shutter songs and <laughs> slacker are there gigs that you've auditioned for that you haven't gotten out of curiosity yeah yeah I, I auditioned for Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. Really? Yeah. Um, Your pants weren't tight enough? They weren't. No. No, I, th I think I, I think I kind of got in there. I, I may have gotten in there after they already felt like they knew who they wanted to go with. Right. Um, yeah, I auditioned for that. And... Um, was, was that a, an L.A. audition? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't one of those things where there's just like a fucking hallway full of people with. No, I kind of, I kind of like. Those scenarios terrify me. Those Barry Squire scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. My, my recollection was that I, I think I kind of like got in there and it was like, okay, we've been doing this all day. I think I was like the last person in. Or right. Something. Good job, kid. Showed up and they were like, yep, those are the songs. <laughs> we'll call you you know um but i think they already knew who they wanted to use and 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 then the tour ended up being insane so right anything else um there was man there was you know there was a lot of like talk Dra to people dragging you down the hall of disappointment <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I've chosen to forget these things, Mike. Um, no, you know, there, there, there haven't been a lot of auditions, but there have been a lot of um, like email talks or phone yeah. conversations. And it'd be like, okay, yeah, this thing is about to happen. And then it would just sort of dissolve. Did you ever get a call for like the who or anything like that? That would be fucking mm -hmm. sick. That would be sick. And I never got some, I never got a call for that. Um, Pretty sweet gig. Yeah, that would have been awesome. There was a call. There was I got a, I got a call about a Morrissey tour, one time. Really? Yeah. How would you feel about taking that gig? I was real conflicted. Right. It, I was real conflicted because it was you know there was a whole lot of other stuff that went to it. Like I had to cut my hair the way they wanted it, and there was you know. No, you know, specific wardrobe, probably vegan, very, very specific wardrobe, very vegan. Um, not that I was necessarily opposed to any of it. Right. But, um, but I remember having this, and this, this is kind of actually where the, the philosophy about making music and being on tour with people came from was I started thinking, well, I'm, I'll only consider it if they're going to pay me this much. Right. And then that became sort of like a mental check, like, wait a minute, hold on. If there's, if there's gotta be like a, a, a number attached to it, then it's not the right, you're not doing it for the right reason. You're not thinking about it correctly because that dude out of anyone deserves people to step up on that stage and, and give those songs everything that they've got, you know? Well, the exciting thing about the last 20, I've seen him many times over the course of 30 years. Yeah. The exciting thing about the last 15 years is that he's doing Smith's material again. Yeah. Which would be pretty fucking cool to do. Yes. Yeah. But I think, you know, and 
I don't actually know how much of a shot I ever really had at being in the band. They ended up, I think you, the, the original, his go-to keyboard player ended up doing that tour anyway. So I think I may not have had much of a shot in the first place, but, but um, yeah, just that thought of like, okay, I'm not, I'm not thinking about this right. Um, kind of, He's also uh, turned into a little bit of a controversial character lately. Yeah. And what is punk anymore though? You know, <laughs> like, like what, how, I, how can you, how can you, it seems like controversy is not, not okay in rock anymore. Right. Be well, because it's we live in a galvanized society. There's, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's a hard line and you exist on one side or the other. Yeah. And uh, I hope that that I hope that the line breaks and both, yeah. both sides dilute one another into a non acidic, delicious beverage of humanity. <laughs> You know, moving yeah. forward, but I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd like there's a I I you know I I fully feel like I 100% fit in with the with like the music community, the rock community community, and the mentality of of the modern art community. There are very few places that that I that I hear people from that world talking about things that I think I don't agree with that, you know. But there's a certain hum like homogenized quality to that that right. feels like man, if like you if you piss those people off, like it you it used to be that that was the point was to piss off the people in the art community, was to do the thing, to, you know, to make people uncomfortable. Right. And it's unfortunate that we're, that the things that make us so uncomfortable now are, are these like issues that. I was talking to someone last night about how in the seventies there was that, there was a weird, time where and i guess people have done it since but it has very much fallen out of favor uh where like the ramones i think even patty smith um uh, lemmy of course mm -hmm. like people were had nazi uniforms or paraphernalia yeah and you know we're not, and they're not fascist, Nazi, racists. No. Although maybe Johnny was questionable. <laughs> um, but you like that could never happen now. I think maybe yeah. Matt Manson did that, but he got taken care of in other ways. Like, yeah, he didn't have to get canceled for that because it his thing came back around on him. But yeah. Yeah, I think uh, and for good reason. What, Look, what, what we're 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 now mad about. Didn't Prince Harry go? You know, like what wasn't wasn't there a you know some kind of controversy over over someone in the royal family wearing uh, a Nazi uniform? To a, I could be totally wrong about this. Um, I mean, somebody, somebody write me and tell me that I'm wrong about that. I uh, would not put but, on a Nazi uniform. I'm a fucking no. Marine Corps veteran, but uh, so I would, you wouldn't catch me dead unless I was in a movie. Right. Playing a fat old Nazi general. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it seems like, yeah, you would never do that, but yeah, there, there used to be this quality to, to rock music, to punk music. Right. that really sought to like, okay, what are these people comfortable with? That's the, that's, that's the thing I need to, to poke at. 
in so our conversation has taken a decided turn yeah <laughs> uh in this climate what how do you think how do people push the boundaries how do people push the envelope now i don't know i like that's that's my that's my biggest question is like where does does rock have a does does rock music have a place in the world anymore because it used like that's sort of where the soul of rock came from right pushing people to the discomfort point you know right and and has it has it outlived its purpose do we need like, to be so comfortable now that that there isn't there isn't an issue that that uh or ha or has on the flip side has it served its has it served its its sociological purpose right and now which it's was to move on. was to push the the sociological buttons and, and now now mumble rap and trap music is pushing the boundaries well or or the things that the the things that rock really tried to do do you know what I'll say that I pro probably a lot of my audience will disagree. Maybe not, but you know, that wet ass pussy song. Yeah. That is like the smells like teen spirit of last year. Yeah. Because it was unavoidable. It was, you know, You know, there are a lot of people who that made, you know, that made them uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and it's, it's edgy. Like you don't want your young daughter to hear it. Cause she's like, dad, what is that? What is this song? Yeah. And so they have the radio edit, but. Yeah. I mean, I maybe it, that's it. it. It could be, you know, it's just, we've. Now, now our, now our American, like our prude Americans are going to like, that's, that's the thing we're going to start pushing the button on now. Right. You know, I do love that more and more and more women are present on stages and yeah. in more, you know, in that, like every genre from metal and extreme metal to folk and con you know like there are genres that women were always associated with and they were always as far as i know accepted i'm sure they were not treated equally in the business dealings because yeah. women have always gotten the fucking shaft but i feel like the, it's an exciting time and maybe it's maybe it's time for maybe it's that's the thing maybe the pushing of the envelope is just pushing back on the fucking sausage party on the, on and, the yeah the Robert Plant hope, sausage pants. I hope that that's what's going on, because, uh, you know, I just want to I just want to know that that progress is being made. Right. Like, it's always been a bit of a social experiment. Everything. You know? And and yeah, I mean. If, if it's my turn to be uncomfortable, awesome. I'm a 50 year old white guy. It is <laughs> definitely my turn to be uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I, you know, I couldn't be a part of a less, I mean, only 70 year old white guys are less popular than me. Yeah. Are you uh, Gen X or millennial? Do you know what? what? I, I believe I fall into Gen X. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I'm okay with that. Do you think we've done an okay job? Mm, I don't. I, I mean, mean, we were the slackers. Yeah. We do. We we did slack quite a bit. I feel but like I don't know. I mean, I got I got a bunch of I got a lot of friends that have that have like seemed like nothing was going to happen with the, with these guys. Right. I had I had a lot of friends when I was younger. And it seemed like, yeah, these guys are all headed for the trash heap. And 
lo and behold, in their like mid thirties, they pulled a rabbit out of the hat and, and have like transcended that thing, right? That laziness or that, that complacency, you know? Child support. <laughs> it has a lot to do with it. Fear is inspirational. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> um, okay. I should walk my dogs, Mark. Well, but I should, yeah, I should feed mine. You I'm have sure. you have shows the thirtieth. Yep. September. This is twenty twenty. Here is twenty twenty one. Yes. Hopefully you're listening before the shows. September 30th, October 1 and 2. Yep. The three consecutive days. Three consecutive days, Seattle, Spokane, Tri-Cities. Are they, did you guys make a website or anything? Uh, we didn't. We got, we've got a, you know, who uses a website anymore? Um, I, I wouldn't even know how to, where to begin on that anymore. You have an Instagram though. We have an Instagram. We have a Facebook page. Yeah. A Friendster profile. Good. Good, good, good. <laughs> uh, but, oh, more, more importantly, the record is, the shows are happening because the record is We're being finally issued on vinyl. Finally, finally getting some vinyl into the world, yeah. 20 years on. Yeah. And is, and Pete's doing it? Yep, Pete, Pete Greenberg. Greenberg, Leighton Print Recordings, he's doing it. Um, and yeah, they've, they've turned out um, amazingly. Um, I ordered mine the day that I saw the announcement. It was, it was a fun, it was a fun process, getting it, getting it all put together. I'll be sure to put a link there. Surely there are, the pressing's not sold out, right? Um, right. The, the pre-order for the pressing is so i think there's a pre there was a pre-order period and now i think you got to wait for the shows to get vinyl okay and then after the vinyl it'll be it'll be available online again am i going to get mine before the shows i hope so fingers crossed we had a uh, we had to we had to go back and and there was a, a problem with with one of them so we had to go back and have a, a new test pressing made Got it. We're we're fingers crossed that things are moving forward. Right. You know how vinyl is. I do. That's a uh yeah. It's a mess. Everything is a mess. Supply mm -hmm. chains. Yeah. Globalism. Yeah. Socialism, communism. Let's go into all of the isms. You want to go into the isms? <laughs> um it was a real pleasure to play with you last weekend, by the way. And same, just same to hang you. out and that that was a fun party. Yeah, it was really fun. We got to play some of my favorite songs. Finally got the video. Yeah, me too. I, you know, the funny thing is playing the Rush song was great, but playing Head Over Heels was the thing that I was most excited about. Yeah, yeah, that was a. Uh... I'm super glad Lance chose that one. Do you know what I did today? Did you listen to that song? I ordered some five driver in-ears. <laughs> <laughs> because it sounded it so terrible in my in my ears. It was terrible. Yeah. It was the worst. Like I probably would have been better without them. Yeah. I took I ended up taking mine out. No, yeah. not not to not to knock the guy that was running our monitors, but no, no, I think I mean I had loner ears, yeah, and they were, you know, falling out of my ears and stuff. So yeah, the 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 five drivers are gonna are gonna make your life better. Five drive, the five drive. So I'm super excited for the record. Very excited for the shows. I I think I'm going to try to come out for Spokane. I Please think do. that's the one. Um that's going to be a really fun one. That venue is awesome. Everyone loves Lucky You Lounge. That place is 
I mean, I haven't actually been there, but I, I just know so many people that, that tour through there and play that venue and everyone comes away thinking it's just the coolest place. Awesome. Um, thanks for giving me so much time and congratulations yeah. to you guys. It must feel pretty good to have something like this happen and it'll be fun for you guys to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't played together in 15 or something years. We didn't even get to talk about Gosling. I know. Maybe, maybe another time. Another time, we'll do a. Maybe, maybe if the Gosling, we, we put out the Gosling record on on <laughs> on vinyl, we'll do that. <laughs> All right. All hey, right, I bet you have uh, some stage shots of yourself from some time recent uh, that you could share with me, right? Yeah, probably. In the posts I make, I'm gonna mangle it. I'm gonna cool. put some kind of, you know. 80s splatter paint behind you love it could you send me a few shots yeah yeah i'll Come find some say hi oh rosie oh rosie look say Here, here's desmond oh desmond look say hi she's like ah oh, i didn't even do my makeup <laughs> See? Oh, oh you stinky breath um thank you so much for giving me so much time yeah, thank you for having me on, man. Hey, you're great. You're great. I'm not as great as you. You're, <laughs> you're greater. Well, agree to disagree. I don't have my own podcast. Hey, uh, this is Mr. Big. You know, um, <laughs> that's why he's called Mr. Big. <laughs> you know, the agree to disagree thing, my wife had never seen Anchorman. And when we were in Nashville, it was playing in the hotel. And, you know, it was like, I turned it on right before that scene. And I was just yeah. laughing the whole fucking time. Right. And she was just like, this is so stupid. Why do you think this is so funny? Because <laughs> like, I'm a 50 year old white guy. Because among my generation, this is comedy gold. This is the best. <laughs> Mr. Big, say hi to Desmond. Dudes, say hi. <laughs> All right. All right, bud. Have a great night. You too. And uh, maybe I'll see you in one month's time. I hope so. Or less than one month's time. Yeah. All right. All right, man. Have a good one.